Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, which today is unusually gossipy, like in a good way. These are some incredible stories. I can't wait to discuss them with you, so let's dive right in. Now the first one is one that turned a lot of your heads this morning, and that's the late night announcement last night that Fox has reshuffled a number of release dates. And who got the short end of the stick? Well, suspiciously, it's those X-Men movies. Now, what makes this even more of an interesting story is that for a hot second there, it looked like maybe Fox was too strong to be just a division of Disney, right? That they were, um, you know, it was like a fire had been lit under them with the threat of this Disney acquisition looming. They wanted to prove themselves. But now it seems either they blinked or someone got to them. Most likely somebody who works for Disney uh, by way of Kevin Feige. So this is what happened. So Bohemian Rhapsody, the Freddie Mercury uh, bio, bio, uh, bio that uh, is still going forward very aggressively, even though Fox had to fire Brian Singer for walking off set and disappearing over the Thanksgiving break, getting into very big fights with his star. Uh, it just was not going well, but they, they replaced him. They got a new director, Dexter Fletcher, who I actually think is quite talented. Uh, his last movie was Eddie the Eagle. Such a good movie. So underappreciated. Uh, if you haven't seen Eddie the Eagle, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, although it's really factually incorrect. And we're going to talk about how important it is for, uh, if it is important for, uh, you know, true life, stories to be accurate when they're told in movies and TV. But anyway, it's still, it's, you know, it's still an entertain, it's still a good piece of entertainment. Uh, so he, his next gig is this uh, taking over Bohemian Rhapsody for Brian Singer, and Fox must feel pretty good about it because they gave it an even more awards-friendly date, uh, release date of November 2nd. It was supposed to come out Christmas Day uh, this, this same year, but that's turned out to be a little bit of uh, a too late a debut for awards contenders. So November 2nd is a very nice date for this movie. Uh, however, that was Dark Phoenix's release date. Oh, you don't say. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that ended up getting moved to February 14th, 2019. Now, that kind of makes sense because, you know, Deadpool, of course, famously came out then and, you know, changed the whole month for Hollywood. Black Panther most recently made good use of the month of February. And so you could argue that Fox feels, well, let's do the same for Dark Phoenix. And even more interesting is that February 14th is not a Friday. Friday that, that, uh, that year uh, in 2019, it's so far away. Uh, it's, I can't believe that it got pushed back that far. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But it, the Friday is February 15th. So to actually release on the, on the Valentine's Day holiday, maybe they're going to play up a romantic hook in the movie, right? Gene and Scott. However, the only problem is they haven't done their work in the previous movies of setting up the Gene and Scott romance, round two. Uh, it wasn't good the first time either with Famke Jansen and uh, James Marsden. So I think that would be a little bit of a hard sell. Uh, they did say it's not a particularly action-heavy movie, that it's more of a drama. So if it's an angsty drama, maybe, that could work for Valentine's Day? I don't see this working. In fact, I think that maybe it won't get released at all. But first, also, New Mutants, because of this, has also been pushed back from February 22nd, which was its new release date. It had already been pushed back significantly for reshoots. They said they were going to add a whole new character, and now it's coming out August 2nd. August 2nd has been a great date for out-of-the-box Blockbuster, Suicide Squad, the first Guardians of the Galaxy. So again, these dates kind of make sense, but here's the thing. They're pushed back so far that the Disney Fox uh, acquisition could be complete by then. And so while Fox was initially very gung-ho with their X-Men movies, like, we're going to make them anyway. We're just moving ahead as if this acquisition, you know, might not happen because we, we don't know if it's going to be approved. Uh, and now it seems that they've, been, they've moved to a holding pattern. So Deadpool is the only one moving ahead. And I think that, as, and as we've all guessed, that's probably the only one that Disney's going to save. Uh, so, so I think that... I think they're pushing the, I mean, I think, I don't know. I'm a little bit, that, that comment about it not being action heavy, Dark Phoenix concerned me. Uh, so I think these are, it's a combination of these films not being particularly strong. Uh, and so Fox is like, the people, Fox are like, we'd like to continue to work here for Disney. So, you know, we don't, I don't, we don't want Bob Iger being like, who's the one who sunk the X-Men franchise? Even lower. I mean, X-Men Apocalypse was not, I enjoyed it as an X-Men fan. And I know many of you did as well, who are fellow X-Men fans. But for the most part, you know, Days of Future Past was the last really strong X-Men movie outside of, you know, Deadpool and Logan and those endeavors. Uh, so, 
that's what I think is happening. And uh, I, I don't know how I, I don't know how bad I feel about these movies being delayed. Uh, if, I mean, if we're going to move this over to Kevin Feige's camp, let's just do it, right? All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the second one is that I can't believe it. MoviePass has actually done it. They've actually moved forward with a major breakthrough of landing a theater chain. As you know, MoviePass is desperate. They just lowered their price once again, but the kicker is it's if you want it for $7 a month, like $6.95, you have to pay for a whole year at once up front. Uh, and I think that's just to get the, keep the cash coming in. And they've had, the name of the game was to stay alive until they could get a theater chain to cut them in on ticket sales and or concessions uh, and and or have a studio studio start, you know, advertising on the MoviePass app. Uh, that's what they needed to do. And, you know, this new deal they've just signed with Landmark Theaters, it's not it's not going to like it's not going to be like everything's OK, but, you know, it's a step forward and MoviePass, you know, they're not going to die maybe as quickly as some of the big chains like AMC and Regal would have liked to have happened. Uh, they might actually make it. So uh, Landmark Theater signed a deal with uh, MoviePass to officially accept the, the app. Uh, and this, uh, this, of course, is the chain of theaters owned by Mark Cuban. We'll get to him in just a moment. Uh, but the thing is, is because of this deal, now if you're a MoviePass member, if you, want, if you are willing to go to a Landmark Theater, they have 53 theaters in the country, just 53, but they're in, I think, most major cities. Uh, but now you can do e-ticketing through Landmark. You can get advanced reservations. You don't have to, uh, I don't believe you have to be 100 yards from the theater anymore. anymore. Uh, and you can also do in-app seat selection. So this is a big deal in making MoviePass even more of a benefit to those who have subscribed. Now, uh, they're up to over 2 million subscribers. I think they're closing in on three. Uh, and if with that amount of subscribers, if they can significantly boost Landmark's business, other small theaters might start to sign on as well. Again, Landmark has just 53 theaters. They're owned by Mark Cuban, or co-owned. He's very pro-digital, and he's also a big disruptor. He really likes to you know, come in there and, and shake things up. So this is a, a deal that not only makes sense for Landmark, which has not been able to really, I think, be a major competitor for the big chains as they probably initially would have hoped. Um, and also it makes sense for Mark Cuban. This is just the kind of you know company that he would be into. I wouldn't be surprised if Mark Cuban maybe got a piece of movie pass come to think of it behind the scenes. That would be a very smart deal for him indeed. How intelligent for movie pass maybe to get an investor uh, who owns a chain of theaters. Oh, it's brilliant. So if MoviePass under this deal can drive enough business to Landmark and also shift it away from maybe big chain theaters in the area, that could force the big chains to maybe have to reconsider as well. So they might, again, MoviePass might just make it after all. And if they can start doing in those restaurant deals that we've discussed, you know, discounts at nearby restaurants and stores because you're in the area, um, they might really start to get some traction. So it's time to reconsider subscribing. Uh, and again, that price just dropped. Uh, so you maybe maybe you do want it to, to sign on. So I think the next question will be how will it affect the movie going experience? If everybody starts being a movie pass member and you're seeing movies essentially for free, how well behaved will the audience be since the the, the activity has no money there's been no monetary sacrifice. Uh, you know, there's nothing leveraged. I'm, I'm, that's what I worry about a little bit. Uh, you know, you think it's bad having people on their phones. You know, now you can really kill time going to see a movie because it won't cost you anything. I know some, I know a lot of people who have this are cinephiles, and so that's great. But I think the, the more popular it becomes and the more people who have it, of course, you're going to have some bad habits develop. So, th and, you know, that's a little nerve wracking. So we'll see. But I'm curious uh, if this is going to, if this is going to make you maybe sign up. Do you, if you're a movie pass, um, uh, subscriber already is there a landmark theater in your area it's very interesting indeed you have to admire it you have to admire what movie pass is accomplishing here all right so then for the third story of the day this is also very interesting a judge has tossed out Olivia de Havilland's defamation lawsuit against FX for feud bet and Joan the true story of whatever happened to baby Jane great movie uh, Olivia de Havilland uh, you know a star of her day. She's not particularly well known to movie fans these days, uh, but she's a pretty big name. She's still alive. Most of the people, of course, depicted in that uh, miniseries are not. Uh, but Olivia de Havilland took, uh, you know, offense at the way she was portrayed by Catherine Zeta Jones. They put, they, you know, Olivia de Havilland was actually the sister of Joan Fontaine. They had a very contentious but yet still private relationship. And, you know, the, the miniseries touched on that. Um, and Olivia de Havilland was not happy. You know, also she comes from an era in Hollywood where you could really control your public image much more so than you can today. So uh, Olivia de Havilland's not used to this.
and I think she wasn't prepared as to how, ha how to handle it best. So anyway, her, her idea was to go to the courts and to sue for defamation, saying, you know, I am the one they're depicting and I'm telling you this isn't accurate. While a judge threw out the case saying, having seen Catherine Zeta-Jones's portrayal of you, it is not offensive to a reasonable person as a matter of law. Meaning, come on, it's not that bad. You know, you might not love it, but this isn't worth suing anybody over or taking up the court's time. That's amazing. That is a huge win, and Ryan Murphy acknowledged this for the current trend of telling true stories. Uh, and I have, a, I have a concern about this myself. How accurate do these need to be? For me, Gianni Versace from Ryan Murphy was the tipping point because so much of that show was made up. That really was frustrating to me. And also, I watched the Unabomber, or I watched half of it, uh, the Paul Bettany Sam Worthington miniseries. I think it was like a National Geographic or something. And I enjoyed it until I, I enjoyed it so much I started to look into the true story while I was watching it, and I discovered that it was largely fictional, the miniseries. And so I understand having to fudge things a little bit here and there, like a show like The Crown does, but you can't just outrightly change history because that, you know, I just don't think that's responsible. And then also, what's the point of me watching it if I haven't learned anything? Now, FX isn't totally out of the woods yet. They're being sued by the Getty family for Danny Boyle's trust, which just started on Sunday night which depicts family members, some of the family members, as being in on the kidnapping. And, of course, some Getty family members aren't too happy about that. Uh, but, uh, tr you know, FX aired it anyway, even though this is still a, a legal matter in, in that, for that series trust. Now, as for de Havilland, since she is not a current star, I think she didn't realize how to appropriately handle this. And what she really should have done, and I think she does have a point, but the best way to combat this would have been to do an interview with like 60 Minutes or some kind of you know mainstream news show and make, you know, really make Feud look bad and just say it's inaccurate. You know, if you're watching this, you're not getting the true story. That would do real damage. That's what she should have done. And so not only is she not uh, out there in, in current Hollywood, but apparently she has no one advising her either who is in, in this space because I think they would have realized that would have been the, the course of action to take. So what do you think? I'm curious, how, how do you feel that these stories need to be, how accurate do you think they need to be? What level of you know, fiddling are you willing to accept? Uh, and also, do you think, do you agree with them that Olivia de Havilland had the wrong course of action? Now, those are the three stories of the day. Now, the viewer question, this comes from Y2K. Y2K has asked this for a couple of days now, and some of you are like, yeah, this is a great question. So uh, it helped sway my picking it. So Y2K says, hey, Grace, I've been squeaky along with this viewer question. I hope you get a chance to answer it. Very nicely said. Some people are saying that Black Panther is doing so well because of repeat viewings, and I often see people giving a lot of weight to repeat viewings when they make box office predictions. So my question is, are repeat viewings really that important for a typical movie's success? Other than making a good movie, what can studios do to get people to watch their movie more than once in theaters? Thanks again for the great videos. Ah, oh, my pleasure, and thanks for a great question. I'm sorry it took me a little bit of time to get to it. All right, so Y2K, uh, my first answer is, is that not for maybe a typical movie, but for a blockbuster, and particularly one that wants to get into the billion dollar club, repeat viewing is a huge Factor. Now, I think that to get that, a movie not only has to obviously be good, but it has to be an experience, right? We're talking about music, the sets, action sequences, action sequences that people want to, you know, you can just have the action sequences, you know, things that people are like, I have to see that again, uh, but also a world that they want to return to. That's where the music and the sets, I think, come into play. Also, you want your movie to be a lot of fun and be something that people are talking about. And therefore, they go and they say to a friend or a family member, you have got to see this movie. And someone says, okay, well, you go with me. And if the person likes the movie enough and they're thinking it's an event and it's an experience, they're like, sure, I'll go with you again. And so I think that's how often people will go and see a movie multiple times as well. So you want that factor in there. Uh, you know, the part, so you want it to be an experience, a world to return to, and a party that people want to go to again and again, and also are, are happy to go again if it means bringing someone new to discover this. So I think those are all factors. And I think that, you know, Black Panther, with its celebration of African culture, culture and heritage, really played into that because, you know, I think that was really special to a lot of people. Also, the representation on a scale that had never been seen before in a superhero movie. For instance, one of you recently, uh, either it was a comment or a tweet, said, you know, uh, a little girl that you know wanted that to be her birthday party movie. So everybody went to see it again. And I think that's really, really nice. Uh, so uh, as for me, I see movies more than once all the time because I see them for the 
press screenings, but you know those are those are very work oriented. So uh, often, you know, the, the, that that weekend or when the movie does come out, uh, you know, I have friends and family who want to see it, and I'm like, sure, I'd love to go again. So uh, another reason I included this question today is I wanted to put it forward to you. What makes you feel that a movie is worth seeing more than once? Because I'm not a good person to ask because I see movies all the time because of my work situation. But I'm so I'm curious for those of you, uh, what why do you go and see a movie multiple times, and what's a recent movie that you have seen multiple times and what were the circumstances. All right, thank you so much everybody for tuning in today. Please write down below what you think today's top three stories, Y2K's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.